Hi, Dr. Barry, Lum of News, Melbourne, Australia. I have just uh, put together an interview we had with John Smith in the UK oh, over a year ago now, and uh, it's, he starts at the very basics and tells us what common law court is all about. And it's amazing the resistance people have against common law because they haven't heard so much about it and they just want to stick to the statute system, which is <laughs> the statutes it should acts all should be on on the stage or rackets on a court. <laughs> anyway, John explains it from from the from the early stages and is on there as well. We Anne and I have been at this from the early stages and now we've got a lot of support at last we've got people interested in getting common law courts going and we've got a lot of help and support and it's going to get better but anyway have a look at john smith in the early days when we were just got involved with him. he does explain it and for those people out there who don't like to be told anything don't worry we there's lots of things we don't know and there's not don't be ashamed about something you don't know. Don't be so defensive about the situation, what you believe in the statute or other laws and stuff like that. Do your research. There's an amazing amount of people who criticize stuff and then you ask them, have they looked and have you looked at this particular video? Have you seen that? And what do you actually know about common law or anything for that matter? And if they're honest, they'll say, no, I haven't looked ahead because I haven't had time. Well, don't make excuses. And if you can't, if you're going to make excuses, don't be critical. Research is the answer. Do it yourself. And when you hear something new, you don't have to swallow it. Just go and check up research and find out. Yeah, that makes sense. Anyway, let's go and have a look at John Smith because it's quite a long video. Uh, please subscribe to, uh, to us to help us out. If you've got a few dollars, send it to the common law court at the end. And uh, John talks about IDs. And I will put the address up when John's talking about ID. And you can send and get one because it does remove you from the fiction. Bye for now. Thanks for watching. Hi from London News. We're now going to go live to Scotland to have a chat with John, John Smith. I believe it's evening in Australia, so welcome to everyone. Hopefully we'll try and clarify some information for you. Uh, I'm aware that people will have a limited understanding uh, or understanding at different levels in relation to the Common Law Court. So what we'd like to do is just give you a, run, a brief run through to explain how this system works, uh, why it was set up and why it's going to benefit the people. Uh, unfortunately, um, if we go back to the basic principles within the statutory system just now, or the government system, uh, we don't actually have justice, believe it or not. Uh, the courts that they actually operate are not courts for justice. They're actually companies, they're commercial interests, and they're run for profit. And that's all it's down to. So basically, it's money that matters, not justice. If you believe you're going to a court to rectify a wrong, or to protect yourself, or to look for a lawful remedy, it, it's not going to exist, not in their courts. Uh, they call them courts, they're not. They're just administrative hearings, places of business, they're corporations. Now, a number of years ago, uh, as we had looked at this uh, in the UK, we had been aware that this was a case, and that fighting within their system, you're never going to win, because at the end of the day, they control the system, they have the rules, and they can change the rules. And they also, if they don't like it, they don't have to apply or abide by their rules. So therefore, you're not hiding to nothing. It's not going to work. Now, we found out, this is through using a case, a previous, previous scenarios in relation to legal systems and justice systems. We looked at case scenarios throughout the world, and we decided that centuries and centuries ago, if we go back, we're probably back with the earliest to the Greeks, the Greeks actually set up a system there. It was quite it was quite good, but what they would do is they would deal with something in the local community if there was a, a crime being committed. What they would tend to do is get together and everyone in the community would sit on a jury 
and they would obviously listen to both parties in the dispute and then give a decision. Now, I'm not going to be sexist uh, or racist, it's, but basically what they did is the Greeks decided that to be lawful, what they were going to do is have a hearing, but it would be everyone in the community, men, would be allowed to attend the co-op. Unfortunately, women weren't allowed to attend the co-op. There was only men. Uh, to make it worse, uh, in addition to the men that were attending, that included not only Greeks, but it also included slaves. So my understanding is slave men got to attend, but women didn't. Now, a bit more uh, update now, so anyone can attend the course that we do. Uh, but the point is, this is how it's structured it. But they dealt with it in the community. Now, you, you've had various other... Uh, cultures, communities, countries had tried something similar. But if we come up to the sort of present day in the last thousand years, uh, in the UK they have operated with uh, a system that was based on shire courts and areas, land masses and that communities. So they set up a small, they had 100 courts, which are effectively families. They, they started off with a, a group of 10 people or a family. And then they took these areas, put 10 of them together and formed a court of 100. So what they would do is treat these as a local community. And when there was a dispute or an argument, they would convene the court from amongst the community. They would set up all the individuals to run the court, i.e. the officers. Uh, they would appoint a jury and they would make a decision. And the decisions were actually binding, uh, uh, was done lawfully, and the community all knew what was going on. Now, these happened, but what uh, run about after Magna Carta, uh, which is 1215, they had actually decided, because the balance had a dispute with the king, King John at the time, they decided to set up Magna Carta. Now, Magna Carta is good uh, in certain respects, but basically it was because of a dispute with the king and the balance, which are all looking out for themselves. But to be, be fair to the balance, they actually says, no, we've got to look at the people here. So they've put many things in to protect the people. So Magna Carta, the original one, can never can never change, never be changed. It's on the record, can never be altered. Now what they've did, uh, they took a couple of variations after it, which have changed, and the government changed it through statutory legislation. Uh, however, the original one can never be changed. But if you tried to use this in the courts, they tried to dismiss it because they know that it is applicable and the judges don't like it, and because obviously they only use statutory legislation. So they try to steer you away from that. But what's happened is through these courts, uh, and obviously with the introduction of the Magna Carta, they then set up appointed sheriffs by the Crown. The sheriffs would then take over uh, charge control in these areas, and they would then raise taxes from the people as well. So the Crown got involved, the government's got involved, and it changed everything. So from then, literally, it says we have a judicial system in this country that is only done through the Crown and the government, uh, taxation and sheriffs. Now, the people have went out a window because they have no say now. So what we looked at is we'll say, look, if you need a lawful remedy, it's been proven that we do not have justice just now because all, all courts are corporations. They cannot protect people. They're not there for justice. It's finance. So if you take away the scenario that they have in relation to statutory justice, it's, it doesn't exist. The only justice available is through the people. Now, to do that, we have a right to convene our own courts. So we can convene a co-op, but having done that and spoken to people about it, we've decided to come up and make sure that it was structurally sound and also that it was lawful. So we've came up with certain conditions. Now, the certain conditions apply. For example, you have to have uh, a, a prosecutor and a defendant. So you have that. It's just you've got the two parties. You have to come to a chosen venue at a certain time and you have to have various officers to assist and you also have to have a jury. Now, the jury can be any number, uh, probably above 12. 12 seems a reasonable number. Uh, we have different people, even in Scotland, we look for a jury of 15, but we've decided this is 12 seems acceptable. So any number from 12 upwards you can have. Now, if you wish to have a jury of 100 people, that's not a problem. But what we've decided is if you're dealing with something, a point of law, we have stated that everyone is born with inherent rights and inherent understanding of right and wrong. So you can do that. So even a small child will know right from wrong. So if you take any reasonably minded men and women and you were to put the information to them regarding a crime that's been committed with evidence, 
these reasonably minded men and women will be able to establish whether a crime has taken place. So there should be no dispute. It should be clear and easy to see. So therefore, if a crime has taken place, it will be easy to establish and therefore we will accept a unanimous decision from these people if there is any doubt with the jury that there is a problem and obviously they're not sure if a crime had been committed. If there's a doubt, they shouldn't be prosecuted. So therefore, if it was only 11 people that voted, it's not unanimous, they don't get the guilty verdict. So it has to be unanimous. And as I said, if you choose to have a jury consisting of 100 people, it's a lot harder to get 100 people to vote unanimously than it is 12. So I've been involved just now. I dealt with the first case myself. Uh, I was quite happy to stick to 12. <laughs> uh, but fortunately enough, I did actually get a result. It was a bit nerve-wracking at the time because it had not been done before. And while I, while I was led to believe later, I don't understand exactly what took place. But I was told that the issue I put before the court was not in dispute because it was very easy, given the amount of evidence that was submitted, that a crime had taken place. But uh, they actually adjourned for quite a while. It was a bit nerve-wracking because we didn't know what was going on. But uh, the reason for the long or lengthy delay is that the individuals who had committed the crime, the jury had wanted to ensure that they were dealing with them lawfully and fairly and that they didn't, didn't actually punish them um, too severely. So it had to be based on the crime committed. So they actually had a lengthy debate about it, because when you're prosecuting someone, it also affects the rest of the family as well, and their careers and various things. So it's quite good, but what's shown when we convene these courts, that people do take it seriously. We've not had a problem with these courts, and it actually works exceptionally well. Uh, we've had numerous courts, but this is how the system works, basically. Uh, we deal with men and women, uh, and you have to establish your position as a man or a woman. Now, for those of you who don't know, there is the, the, there is a concept of a legal fiction which is attached to people. I would suggest if you're not sure to go and do some studying, uh, the website does have information on this as well, uh, but it comes up legal fiction, fictitious name, legal entity, or even the straw man. Effectively, when you're born... Uh, with the creation of a state birth certificate, the state create what is known as a legal fiction, a legal identity, and they try to attach it to the living, uh, the living child. Now, that will remain with you throughout your life, and they will only ever deal with that to punish you. So just now, if I was to ask for uh, proof that you're a living man or woman, uh, unless you've recorded a declaration with the common law court, you have no way of proving that you are a living man or woman. Uh, if someone was to meet you face to face, they can see you're living. But if they left you, uh, obviously didn't see you in eyesight. If they were to speak to someone else, they couldn't convince someone that you they they had met you and you are living, because there's no record of you. Nothing exists. If I ask you to prove your identity, you will give me statutory documentations. You'll give me a driving license, a passport, an insurance card, a health card. It could be a mortgage agreement. It can be a loan agreement. Uh, it can be any sort of documentation. It can be a utility bill. All these things are for the fictitious name, the legal entity. So it shows you that when you deal with the government, they do not deal with you as a living man or a woman. And as a living man or woman, you have no rights in their courts. They cannot deal with you. And under their courts, you abide by their rules for the fiction, which means you don't get justice. If you stand as a living man or woman and you confirm that, not only does it protect yourself even within their court, so-called court, it also gives you the right to obtain ownership of the legal fiction, which takes away control completely from the state so you don't have to worry about their courts. And not only that, as a living man or woman, you have the right to obtain a lawful remedy for any harm, loss or injury that's caused to you. So you can do so by going to the people and not to a statutory court. You have a right to convene a court. You will get assistance from obviously the individuals in Australia, these committees that help out within your states as well. These people are there to assist you. They're there because they know the system. They're working with us just now so they understand and can utilize this in Australia. They will assist you with the setup of these courts and they will give you instruction. Now, when you attend these courts, it says you do so for one reason and one reason only, a lawful remedy. You will be given assistance to help pre prepare your case, present your case, 
and you do so to the public. The jury trials, this is consist of hopefully it says 12 jury members, but the staff that you require for these hearings are also appointed on the day and they're selected for members of public. But they're not hand selected. You see, they can have no involvement with the parties that are at the trial, uh, either parties. Uh, and the point is, when you actually select these people, it's done randomly. You do not just ask for volunteers and then someone will pick them. That's not the case. If necessary, you will draw lots, but it's done randomly. And then the officers at the court will be given instruction on the day prior to the hearing. But anyone can do it. We will have accepted a certain process. And we've all accepted that providing these conditions are followed, it is a lawful decision that is obtained and there are ways to enforce the decisions afterwards. So providing obviously people work together, it will make a huge change to the justice system in Australia. It will offer protection. And the thing to remember is that by standing united, it should you not only deal with your own community, whether it's a state or national one, you also deal with a wider picture because you're then dealing with people in different countries. You know, the people all deal with local issues in their own country, but the people stand together, uh, stand together sorry, under the same principles. They cause no harm, no loss, no injury, and ensure that you're honourable in contractual dealings, providing you stand together. If there's any problems throughout the world with people not standing together, they have the right to convene a court but when they do so, they have the backing of the people internationally. And this is what will be applicable to the Australians as well. It says you get there, they stand together, not only through your own states, nationally and internationally, you've got the backing of the whole system behind you, which allows you to address crime and it will offer you the lawful remedy you want. Okay. Thank you for very much for that, John. Well, first of all, I said the main thing is to take any case to a common law court. There's a couple of things you need to know. Have you suffered uh, because of a crime committed against you? If there's no com crime committed against you, you can't take a case. You have to suffer a loss. Secondly, if you take a case to a common law court, you can only do so against another living man or living woman. So if, for example, you state that I've suffered uh, a crime uh, and I've been subjected to um, harm and loss because of a, um, just say, a, a government body, a council. So therefore, I want to sue the council. I want to hold them accountable. How do I do that? In common law, common law court, you can't. So what you do is you're holding the individual in charge of that body. So if it had been a council, it could either be a director, it could be a CEO, or it could be a manager that you dealt with uh, throughout the line. If you have a line manager that you've dealt with on a day-to-day -day basis and they haven't rectified the problem for you, you've suffered a crime, you hold that individual accountable, but they are held accountable as a living man or a living woman, not as the manager or CEO, you hold them as a living man or woman, acting in a capacity. Uh, to provide a paperwork, just to give you a quick run-through, there is a procedure and there's training available that we'll cover with people. But the simple scenario is, if you wish to convene a court, what you've got to do is follow the procedure. The first procedure would be to obtain a venue, a suitable venue which will hold a minimum of 50, maybe 100 people. It has to be open to the public. You would then have to send out a court summons to the opposition and summons them to attend the hearing. Now, the summons, there's about four documents to be included with that. Uh, but basically you have to give them the required paperwork confirming they're being summoned to a common law court with the relevant information. You also have to give them an introduction sheet. So if you're prosecuting someone, they've maybe never heard of a common law court. So you can't just say you're coming to a common law court and that's it. You have to educate them and tell them what their options are and what's about to happen. So there's an instruction sheet which will explain to them what their rights are and what they can, can't do to defend themselves. So you submit the paperwork to them. They will have the opportunity to put in a written defence uh, or they also have the opportunity to instigate what we call a pre-trial conference. <clears throat> so if they don't believe or they don't wish to go to court, they can try to contact the individual who's raised the action to say, look, I don't want to go to court. We have a dispute. I would like to have a pre-trial conference to discuss the matter so it'll save us going to court. They have the option to do that. You have a right, if you raise an action, not to speak to them. You don't have to go. 
He says, but obviously the jury will find out if this has been turned down. However, if they turn around and say they would like to meet, that will only be at a suitable venue, which is agreed by both parties. So if they ask you to attend their works building in a council council headquarters, you're not going to go there. So it'd be a neutral, neutral venue, and it's somewhere that you both agree with. Now, providing that's the case, the parties that turn up are also allowed to take one witness with them, someone else. Now, it could be anyone, and then the four individuals at the hearing, that hearing can also be recorded with audio if they want. So anyone's entitled to do that, and that can be used at the hearing if you wish to do so. Um, if they don't take up the option for the pre-trial conference, uh, they have an option to put in a written defence. If they don't put in the written defence, or even if they have, what happens then is that the hearing will go ahead on the day in question. There's three or four documents to serve them. One is a summons. Now, when you issue a summons to the individual, that is your claim. Uh, you obviously have a statement of claim as well, which is attached to it. The summons, the statement of claim, you have obviously an introduction to the common law court as well. So in your initial part that you serve to the opposition, that will have your original claim. That will highlight why you're bringing the dispute about, what you're claiming they've done wrong and the damages you're looking for. So that will all go into the initial part, but that is served on them. They then have the right to respond. So there is a pre-trial conference available. They can put in a written response. And then if the dispute still exists, what you then do is you then proceed to the trial. But the, pay, the only thing you have to do is prepare the paperwork. Now, in relation to paperwork, you don't have to, you don't have to be a, a lawyer, a solicitor, or a barrister. Basically, you put it down, plain and simply. Now, the paperwork available is available, providing certain criteria is covered in the paperwork, and it's there. Effectively, it's a template document. There is a template available. If you just put in the detail concerning yourself, it's simple and straightforward. Now, again, because you guys here are helping with this process, you're there to give advice and instruction to people, and you can help them with this process. But all they have to do is fill out a, a basic form confirming their personal details and what happened to them, and that's it. And then you make sure that the paperwork is sent out accordingly, the procedures followed, and then you move on to the next step. Alex, yeah, Alex? That's brilliant, Sorry. John. Stephanie? Yeah. Yes, do, do, I, do I need, if I'm, I'm doing all that process, do I need to list what my evidence is going to be? And then do I list any witnesses that I might call? Yeah, when you're putting, when you put in your case, uh, when you put in your claim just now, you have to highlight the harm, loss and injury it was caused. You highlight obviously what they've done to you, what you're looking by way of reparation. And also it says you have to highlight that and give them access to evidence. So you put in any additional documents, if you say that you're calling witnesses as well, you have to identify the witnesses you're calling and let them know that you're calling these witnesses. Now, they will get, as I said just now, we can go and you can, they, these documents are here. It's straightforward. They will be available to the public. But the point is, you keep it simplified. So all you do initially is you get the venue for the premises, uh, for the hearing, when you do that, you're required to instigate the action. To instigate it, you have three or four documents to send. Now, that includes information for the opposition about the common law process, instructions in relation to how they can defend themselves, and your statement of claim. So you do that, you put all these documents in, that will cover everything that's going to happen. Now, you can actually go into more detail and spend time. They are simple documents, uh, the statement, but basically that's what's required. From that, when you go to the hearing, uh, on the day in question, the doors are open at the specific time and the public can attend. Now, any members of the public can come in, but this is when you're actually using members of the public, they can only attend and participate in this as, a, a, as an official or obviously as a duty member if they do so as a living man or woman. Now, they don't have to, uh, they don't have to have recorded their information on the website is as although that would confirm their standing, if on the day they confirm that they are there as a living man or woman, they can be taken in and they will sign paperwork accordingly to say that. So the jury members are selected and obviously the court officer are appointed. There's some instruction given to the court officers. There's some instruction given to the jury. But before you get to that stage, there'll be an introduction given. This is probably about 15, maybe 20, 25 minute talk. And that will explain to everyone on the day who's turned up 
what is about to happen. So there'll be a full run through and it will explain all aspects of what's happening, the stage you're at, and then you'll then pass it on. And what you will have is you'll have one individual who will be the court adjudicator. They will actually take over and they will conduct everything. Now, the court adjudicator is quite good because they actually don't take any part in the case at all because they've got nothing to do with the jury, they've got nothing to do with the parties. The court adjudicator is just someone with the relevant experience uh, to conduct this and ensure it's lawful. So the court adjudicator will be there and what they will do is they will then explain to the public what's going on and then with the expertise they'll ensure that all the appropriate people are appointed and then you will then pass on the instruction and allow the individuals to convene the court. Um, the opposition, both sides, are given a chance to put their case for, uh, for, to the jury. They'll be, given a quest, uh, they'll be given the opportunity to question one another as well and again the jury will then deliberate. There is also uh, various things. For example, if you if you summon someone to appear, uh, it could be a member of a, some authority or something. If they've committed serious crimes against the people, they're not going. They're not going to want to appear in trial. They're not going to want to answer to the people as well, given what they've done, and they may not wish to attend. Now, just because they don't attend, it doesn't mean to say that you're going to prosecute them and find them guilty. They have a right, and they have rights whether they're there or not. Now, if they don't appear, we would take it that the individual has not offered a defence, has not contacted you for a pre-trial conference, and doesn't want to engage with the public. So therefore, because there's been no rebuttal from the papers that were submitted to the court, you would take it that that individual is guilty. However, because we are more honourable than the existing statutory system, and we do things lawfully, we will not charge and punish someone without establishing the facts. So although it's more than likely they'll be guilty because of their non-appearance, it is still down to the individual who raised the case to cover the information and evidence he has and to convince the jury. And only then, if the jury are convinced, they will say, yes, okay. They'll also take into consideration either the appearance or non-appearance of the defendants. But there are ways to deal with it. So the instruction here, this is how it works. And at the end of the hearing, after the jury deliberate, a decision will be given and that's it. Now, that in a nutshell is a simple format. It's more a little bit more complicated than that. Basically, that is basically the, the information in a nutshell. The paperwork is provided. You summon someone for committing a crime. They appear there. You appoint the officers, appoint the jury, conduct the hearing. Everyone has a role to play. And then you obtain the decision, either guilty or not guilty. And then that's recorded. Now, all the individuals that take part on the day are required to sign off, swear their oaths and various things. So that's all done in the day in question. It's all part of the procedure. Providing everything's been done step by step and signed off, at the end of it, you will have convened a lawful court and you will have a lawful decision which will stand up in law. And just now, we're showing within the system that the people are standing together. Now, we stand together to address injustice and crimes against the people. So it doesn't matter where you are. It's the same principles. Um, it's, again, we, we, we use names. We, we, we use the name of common law. It was just a name we opted for at the start. But this is applicable to everyone. Some people don't like the terminology common law, but it's exactly the same as anything else. For example, it can also be known as natural law, universal law, the creator's law, God's law, or law of the land. So all of these things are applicable. Now, they're all applicable in different countries, but they follow the same basics in relation to harm, loss, and injury. So what happens is we've agreed a situation whereby if you follow the process, it will become lawful. Now, regardless of the country you're in, the people in all these states or all these countries worldwide, we have 115 now, they've established the fact that they will accept this as a lawful court case and a lawful ruling. So they're happy because this has already been established. Now, if anyone convenes a court anywhere, they must follow the procedure. If they do not follow the procedure, according to people who have confirmed their standing with the common law court, the people would not accept it as a lawful decision, and therefore it's void. And it's a complete waste of time. And to be quite honest, it would actually be 10 times worse than the statutory system we have. Yeah. At least with the statutory system, we know they're criminals, we know it's for money, and we know what they're doing. These people that were to convene courts to try it themselves, to do it unlawfully, not to follow the procedure, 
and to try and come up and enforce a decision. That's actually worse than the authorities because they're actually doing it sneakily by trying to cover up and they're trying to disguise the fact that they're using a process. So the process is established and the good thing about it is the process does not exist for one man, it's for everyone. The common law court is the people and unless the people accept it as lawful, it's not, it's not lawful, it's not valid. So therefore, that being the case, it will not stand. Now, to answer your question in relation to having it registered or approved or something, it's not a matter of approval. It's basically getting it checked. Now, you do something in convene a court to establish it's lawful and to have it recorded on the site. The site is run, the international one, is run through the UK. That's where we've done it. Now, everything goes up from any country, any court that's convened. But before anything goes, goes on to the site, the people have to ensure that it's lawful. So protect the process and to protect the people, the process will be examined before it goes up on the site. Now, the other thing we do have is to obviously ensure that everything is done correctly, we do take a, take an audio recording of the hearings as well. So the audio is listened to, the paperwork is inspected, providing everything has been done correctly, it will be acceptable and we will put it on the site. And again, that is down to what the people have already established is acceptable procedure. Okay, Barry? Yes, yeah, sorry? Uh, Your need will be made available. So anyone that wants to consider using a court will be presented with a full copy of the documents. As I said, they are sort of template documents and they all they need to do is just put in the basic facts. The fact that you're working with this in Australia, you'll be there to assist them to work with people and to coach them. Uh, in the preparation of these forms. Now, we're not actually, we're not dealing with their system, the statutory system. We're not lawyers. We don't use legalese. It's basically down to plain English and basically reporting a crime that took place. That's it. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, they can. Yes, it is all contracts. Look, when you come down to common law principles, first of all, have you established your position as a living man or woman? So providing you do that, you can then say, right, I'm now going to use this system in the process. Now, if you've suffered harm, loss, or injury, it may be because of a fraudulent contract. So therefore, if you address the contract there and you've signed it in the presence of a bank manager and they've obviously dealt with you, they can be held, held responsible for any loss or harm caused. You can do that by taking them to common law court. Uh, you have the contractual, uh, the contract there and the information I said, regarding the harm, loss or injury caused, put before a jury and providing they are happy, they will then obviously hopefully find in your favour. Uh, but yes, it doesn't matter. They exist. Their system just exists for money. It's corporations. It's all run for money and profit. We highlighted the crime of criminal coercion. It's basically when they have created a legal fiction, they then attach it to you by way of a slave name. So they give you the slave name and tell you that you are the slave. Now, if you accept it, you're bound by their rules. But if you state that you're a living man and you don't accept it, what they're doing is committing a crime against you. Now, through contracts, what they do within the system, yeah, what they do within the system is they obviously get rope in the legal fiction and say to you, you will sign here, here's a contract. Now, that in itself is okay because as a man or woman, living man or woman, you can contract. Providing you remain honourable in your contracts, there's no crime. So you can have a contract with them, a valid one. Unfortunately, it's not valid because what they are doing is they're using the legal fiction and they're not telling you about it. So they're holding you accountable as a legal fiction, which they can't do. There's no full disclosure. And according to their rules, it's a crime. And they can be prosecuted for that. But under common law, as a living man, you can then charge them in a common law court and they will have to repay everything. The issue, when we look at the property, if we if we look at their rules, the rules, they're not laws, they're rules, it's corporations, so it's company policy, right? What they do is they have a building and they say, we want to make money. So what they're going to do is they're going to sell it, but they keep it under their control, so they will take the title deeds and they will put it into somewhere. In the UK, it's the land registry or the land registrar. So you put it in there, they have obviously a copy of the deeds. They, they obviously keep a record of it. What they do is they sell it to an individual. But when they send it to an individual, or sell it to an individual, sorry, they sell it to the legal fiction, not the living man or woman. So the legal fiction has it. And again, because it's a legal fiction, their rules apply again. 
right? So their rules of tying you up in their system and the house and the legal fiction is owned by them. Now, what we do is if we go back to basics now, are you a living man or woman? Well, I would say yes. I says, okay, I have no computers, I agree, but I would like to think you're real. You are a living man or woman. If you confirm that with a declaration to the common law court, you've established now a record of your birth. Now, it's not a birth of affection. It's a birth of a man or woman. Now, when you establish that, it is put onto a registrar. We call it the Book of Deeds. It's just a list of people. Now, when we put it there, you're not giving any away, anything away. You're not signing anything over. You're making a declaration. You're making a declaration to the common law court. It's the people. You are the common law court. You own the information. You're not doing anything with it. You're making a de declaration to confirm who you are. Now, having done that, it says what will happen... Uh, this, Okay, I'm sorry. Do you want, yeah. I just wanted to go back a step. When you go yeah. to the bank, you go because you've got no money to buy the house, right? So yeah. you have to go into their system to get the money yeah. to buy the house, right? Yeah. And then, and then you, you, then you're basically turning it back around on them and saying, "Well, I'm a, I'm a living man or I'm a living woman," and but you still got this mortgage. So you basically saying. You're sort of paying it off in good faith. Is that what you're saying? No, what I'm saying just now, if, if today, if you confirm that you're a living woman and you've made that declaration in the site, you have a choice to continue as a living woman or you can actually use the fiction if you've taken control, which there was a way to go on to. Mm. So we'll explain that in a minute. But the point is, if you enter into a contract now, it says it will be honourable. You have to enter it and you know what the situation is. What we do previous to you declaring that you're a living woman, it says, say, if we go back a year, if you had a mortgage, when you went for that mortgage, you would not have been aware of the crime committed through criminal coercion. So therefore, because they've committed this crime, it then means that you're entitled to get everything back. And because obviously you have the house anyway, you keep the house as well, because they've obtained it unlawfully, they've obtained the money unlawfully, They've prosecuted you, but you've bought that in good faith. So you'll understand a little bit more. When you confirm that you have uh, established your position as a living man or woman, what you then say is, great, I've protected myself. Well, no, you don't. Because what happens, if, remember, the property is being sold to the legal fiction and the property is registered with the government as a legal fiction. So what you do is you say, I have to, I have to protect myself. But as a living man or woman, you have the right to claim ownership of the legal title that was attached to you because at birth, the government has said they were creating a legal title. So they created this fiction for you. But according to their rules, um, they've done so unlawfully, fraudulently, criminally, because what they should do is tell your parents what happened and tell you when you grew up what happened. They didn't. They hid this fact but they've created the legal fiction. Now, according to their rules, if it involves more than one individual, well, it did, it involved you, your parents, and the government. The rules state it's a contractual agreement. Now, if it's a contractual agreement, certain obligations have to be fulfilled. Now, you can go into them, there's a few of them, but one easy one to do is say, was there full disclosure? No, there wasn't. You weren't told about it, so therefore, on that point alone, it's void. Because they haven't complied, it means the contract is void and it means the use of the legal fiction by the state is also void. So therefore, because the legal fiction exists, it's on all your documents and you use it daily, who should the rightful owner be? Well, the rightful owner should be the individual that was given the birth name anyway. So having confirmed that you're a living man or woman, the common law court dictate that you are or you have a superior claim and if you wish to, you can make an application for ownership of the fiction. Now, in doing so, the fictitious name application you make, but providing you follow the rules and you've recorded as a living man or woman, you'll be granted ownership of the legal fiction and you'll be given a business ownership certificate. Now, having done that, you get the interesting thing because now you have a unique experience. You have identified yourself as a man or woman, but you're also on the legal fiction. Now, if we go back to the property, who owns the property? Well, the legal fiction does. Who owns the legal fiction? You do, as a living man or woman. Do you wish to leave it in their system where it's corrupt? 
or do you want to move it? Well, their system's corrupt. You're not going to leave it there. So you say, no, I'm going to move it. So what you do is you can apply on the court, court site to transfer the document. It's a sale declaration. But in effect, it's a sale and transfer declaration. So what you're doing is the legal fiction that owns it, which you're in charge of, you're going to take the legal fiction. You're going to make an application to sell and transfer it. And what you do is for a nominal fee, say a dollar, he says, with yourself, you take that uh, title and you transfer it to the living, living individual, so the man or woman. So what you do, in my case, Mr. John Smith, the legal title, is going to take that title, transfer it to the living man for a nominal fee, which is private. It's got nothing to do with the state. But it's recorded on the form, and in doing so, you've now taken the legal title off the, off the title deeds. You've moved the common law a man or woman onto the title deeds, and you've transferred the jurisdiction from the state now under common law. And then all we do is we notify the government that we've moved it in, under common law jurisdiction and that they have no say in it. Now, we've done this for many, many people in the UK. I think we've got hundreds of properties on, and I think there's, there's, we've got the properties we've lost, I think about four properties. They were quite complicated, but we're still fighting with them just now. But we have hundreds of properties we haven't lost, and the, the government don't like it, the banks don't like it, obviously. They drag us into court, they say, but it doesn't work. We will do this, and we're establishing more and more just now. And over the coming months, we'll actually have a lot more uh, information that's going to come out to assist in this process. But it has been successfully, and what happens is when you change and you establish a crime's been committed, technically, when you move it, you no longer have to honour that contract as void, which means you don't have to pay your mortgage. Yeah, that was a good question, Anne, and John answered that really, really well. And it goes back to, in their system, a unilateral mistake, which I've mentioned a few times. Yeah. John mentioned that the unilateral, they did not give you full disclosure. So, and actually, you sign away your power of attorney to that fiction as well. So, that's the, 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 the common law court, obviously, is a, is a great remedy. And Anne's got another question. And go ahead, Anne. We'll be for example, say, I was through this to my house, okay, with the common law court. Yeah. Now, would I be would I be required to say, for example, write to the council, write to some organisations to say I have now registered my house with the Common Law Court to let them know that it's only, out of their jurisdiction? The only thing I would do is I'm not sure how it works in Australia, but obviously to remain honourable, you should inform someone. So in the UK, what we have is we call some it's something called the Land Registry in England and Wales. In Scotland, it's called the Registrar's Office. So uh, whoever keeps a note of your title deeds, you register it with them. What you do is you notify them. We have a template letter uh, that you write to them and say, look, I'm confirming my position as a living man or woman. I've made, submitted a declaration to Common Law Court. This is my reference number here, confirming that I'm a living man. I've also obtained ownership of the legal fiction. Here is my reference number. As I've obtained ownership of the feature, uh, the legal fiction, I've now purchased my house and transferred it to common law. This is my property. This is the title deed number you have. It's been transferred from the legal fiction to the living man or woman. And again, it's been issued, recorded with the common law court and now has this new reference number. This property no longer comes under statutory jurisdiction. It's now under the jurisdiction and protection of the common law court, and therefore you cannot proceed to argue that. They've tried on a couple of occasions to force someone out, and they've came. Uh, we've went in and challenged them. This is, we're still fighting with them just now. There uh, have been a couple of cases, and as I said, it's now three or four cases, but the rest of them have all been left to properties. They don't like it. They still send threatening letters occasionally, but at the end of the day, it's fine, and the people don't pay the mortgages. Um, we, the process is here, is, is it uncovers, what you've got to remember is it uncovers crimes against the people. It's there to provide a lawful remedy for the people and we're there to assist people. We don't actually charge for this, it's basically it's a process that's available that anyone can use. The paperwork will be uh, there, there'll be training materials going up, there'll be more and more information coming out. Uh, they've also got direct links to people in other countries as well and even in the UK. So we're all working together to address this. Uh, and the point about doing this is we stand together. And this is why the state can't deal with it, because we're all standing together. If you do that, it gives you the authority we have. If you are given the heat in Australia, if you have a, a winter coat, a really thick winter coat for snow, 
Uh, I don't know if you know what snow is, but say if you have a, a winter coat for the snow and the bad weather, you're not going to wear that in the height of summer. So you're going to go out with your T-shirt and your shorts on in summer, you're not going to wear a winter coat. It doesn't mean to say you haven't got it. It means that it's something that belongs to you and you will choose when to use it. It's the same with the legal fiction. You know you have a legal fiction, you own it, but you choose when and if you want to use it and it's under your control and ownership. We had a dispute uh, a few days ago. Um, now, we have actually dealt with the issue of enforcement in the UK because we have a small enforcement team. It's about to become considerably larger in the next few months, but we do have enforcement people. And now, having set that up, we have a uniform as well, and they've been sworn in and they have badges. What happened is a member of the public uh, who's a friend of one of the enforcement uh, guys we've got had says, look, there's a problem here. Now, it was a dispute over a car, but what had happened is the police in the UK had obviously decided that they were going to prosecute this individual for an offence. So they took this individual in. Uh, he wouldn't give his name. He said he stood under common law. He was a living man, but they took him in. So they put him in, uh, in the jail. Uh, he wouldn't give his details. So they then took him to the court. I think it was the day after. He refused to give his details, so they put him back to jail. Now, what had happened is they detained him for a couple of days. I'm not sure what the, the length of time is, but basically after holding someone for so long, you need to apply to the court for an, ext for an extension to hold them or detain him, to detain him for longer. So they did actually apply to the court and they got an extension. So uh, this enforcement officer contacted me and says, look, we have a problem here because they're detaining this guy unlawfully, they're lying. He said they have no rights at all and they won't accept his position. I said, well, they don't have a choice. He says, take his birth certificate, take his fictitious name ownership, take it to the police station and basically hand it in and tell him you want him removed immediately. So they had him in a lockdown and what happened is this enforcement officer went, uh, the station was locked up, he pressed the buzzer a policeman had came out, so he identified himself, given his ID, highlighted that he was an enforcement officer for the common law court. He then handed over the documentation confirming this individual's position and that the statutory rules are not applicable and then demanded that he be released immediately. If he wasn't, the police officer there at the door would be, uh, would be held personally liable along with the chief constable. So he then, the enforcement officer, left to go home 45 minutes later, he got a phone call from his friend. And his friend says, look, he says, uh, I'm just phoning to have a chat. And the guy says to him, well, where are you? He says, I've got out. What the hell did you say to them? He said, well, I came in and just told them they couldn't do it. So he handed on the common law court documents, the paperwork, and he told them they were committing a crime, they were unlawfully detaining them, and they had no right to hold them, and the police had to let them out. So he was let out yesterday. Now, if he wasn't released yesterday, they would have kept him over the weekend as well. But he was in for three days. And because we established a position uh, with our enforcement team, the police had to re release this guy. You do not have to accept their system. And again, it says they will try and enforce the issue. But it's if you stand up with the common law rights and the common law documentation, if you know what you're doing, you see they cannot detain you. And the longer they detain you, if they do, they will be held personally liable uh, and all you need to do is get this done once or twice and then when they realise they'll be held accountable and they do have to answer for the people it will change. All it needs, it does work and uh, this is why the common, the common law court is structured in such a way that they cannot take us on. So therefore it says what we're doing is lawful and it's backed 100% it is, it is lawful and the authorities have to decide exactly what they're going to do and we've got them in a corner just now they cannot continue what they're doing because it's coming out and they will be held accountable now if we actually go ahead and prosecute an individual uh, having done that uh, it means that everyone else has got to then back off we've taken on additional individuals and because of the coronavirus as well this is the documents are taking weeks to get through this is something that will change in the future and when we get countries involved and they're settled in the north, what we'll be able to do is start producing them locally. So obviously it will speed up. Uh, but you can get these documents. The other thing that people like to do, it's a lot easier to carry, is a common law court card. Because by doing that, uh, it covers not only your standing as a living man or woman, but it also confirms you own the fiction. It also has your photo ID. So when you do this, uh, if you have that there, 
it's a lot easier to confirm your position. Now, we've actually used them, and what I will say is we have well over 600 occasions where we've used documentation from the common law court. We've even prosecuted politicians and judges, and all the documents we've taken, over 600 of them, not one document has ever been challenged. In fact, even in Queensland, the government in Australia, they've actually accepted our documentation and granted permanent uh, residency for a mother and two children over there on only a birth certificate from the common law court. So they are lawful documents and they will establish your position and they are handy to have.